we are uh, constantly amazed because your revelation, who you are, what you've done for us, and your involvement in our lives is always just beyond what we can figure out and grasp. The best revelation that we can get a hold of from your heart still astounds us because we know that that is so, what we have gotten a hold of is just a beginning of what you have really done and where you have really gone for us. And we come to the Christmas scene, you being born and becoming man for the purpose of death and redemption, and we just shake our head. Save us, O God, from the light and the superficial and the insignificant of Christmas gifts and stuff that doesn't make any difference and bring us back to the reality of who you are. And indeed, it is really all about you. So reveal that to us, we pray thee again tonight. In Jesus' name I ask it, amen. When you come to verse 1 of chapter 1, uh, Luke starts his book with this phenomenal idea. And he starts with the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And the word book is really the word record. So this is the account, the record of. And when he gets done with that, he says it's the record of the genealogy. And the word for genealogy is a Greek word that you know and are familiar with because it's the word genesis, which is, of course, the origin idea, the beginning of something idea, which is the first book of the Bible. So this is really the record, the, uh, the beginning of, the account of, the beginning of, the origin of this man called Jesus Christ, which is a phenomenal way to start the book. He immediately then moves into the idea of the son of David. And the reason for that is because if you were a Messiah, if you were in Jesus' day and you claim to be a Messiah, the first question they're going to ask you is, uh, are you of the lineage of King David? And if you are not, you could not possibly be the Messiah because that was the promise that had been given to them. Uh, So Matthew says, hey, I'm writing to Jews. Let's get this under our belt. Let's get this settled. Jesus has the right to be the Messiah because he is of the lineage of King David. And he goes through 42 generations of uh, individuals bringing us up to Christ. And when you come down to verse 16, Jacob begot Joseph. Jacob was the father of Joseph. And Joseph was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So he comes right up to the climax of the genealogy by giving us this birth of Jesus, 42 generations of it. And then when he gets done with that, Uh, We don't have time to go into all of the details of it, but in verse 16, he literally takes a gigantic knife and just slices Joseph clear out of the picture and says, yeah, I've given you 42 generations, bringing you up to Jacob, Joseph, and then Jesus. But to tell you the truth, Joseph didn't have a thing to do with this. Joseph was the, uh, what would you call him, the adoptive father of Jesus. Uh, So he adopted Jesus, but he, he really didn't have anything to do with this. And he leaves you dangling. And instead of a genealogy solving the problem and you walk away saying, oh, I know exactly what's going on here, he leaves you going away scratching your head saying, what exactly is taking place if Joseph wasn't involved in this whole thing and you just gave me 42 generations of people and you took me down through King David and you laid all this out for me, what's that all about? Because if Joseph didn't have anything about, it, about didn't have anything to do with it, where do you go with this? Who Who really brought Jesus into being? And he says in verse 18, Now the birth. Interesting that the word birth there is the Greek word Genesis, which is the same word that they translated in verse 1, genealogy. So I want to propose to you, he's giving you two genealogies. He's saying here's the adoptive father genealogy, 42 42 generations of it. But Joseph didn't really have anything to do with it. He's just the adoptive father. Let me get down to brass tacks here, give you the real genealogy. What really happened in all of this won't take two to four, it won't take 42 generations. I can solve this problem for you just immediately. And he says, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. He was born of God. 
A phenomenal passage. Two genealogies. Adoptive father genealogy, real father genealogy. Born of God. It's interesting when you get into the verse after his, mother, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. And of course you can't understand that at all unless you understand the betrothal idea. It was not an engagement thing like we would experience engagement. Uh, are you married? No, we're engaged to be married. That's not this. Betrothal is an altogether different deal. In that age, uh, probably uh, Mary was maybe, uh, could have been 12, 13 she would have been a young teenager, no doubt. Joseph may have been older. We don't know a lot about Joseph. By the time Jesus is 12, right after that, Joseph disappears from the scene. We don't hear anything about him from then on. So we don't know. Probably he died and is out of the picture. So uh, Mary is on her own. But the betrothal period is that a, a man would go to uh, the father of the one he wants to marry. And he would uh, enter into a legal binding contract and pay a dowry. It's that kind of thing. In the Jewish mind, he would pay for his wife. So he would give her dad this dowry, whatever it might be, whatever the price might be. And of course, the reason for that is the, if the marriage went south, she'd probably come home and he's going to have to foot the bill. The dad is, so you better pay if you're going to leave her. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, so the dowry was set up. And uh, he would come and uh, enter into the contract. The minute the contract was signed, they were legally married. And the marriage then had two parts to it. One is this betrothal thing. The other is the wedding ceremony itself. The betrothal period normally lasted about a year. And during that time, the bride-to-be and the bridegroom had no or little interaction. If they wanted to have interaction, if they, wanted to, if they wanted to say something to each other, they would do it normally through a note system, and the bridegroom, for instance, would have a guy that was his best friend, which is where, where we get the idea best man from, and he would give the information to the best man. The best man would go to the bride-to-be and would give her the information or pass the note. So during this betrothal period of, of a year, they didn't live together. They had very little social contact together. It was a probation, get ready kind of a period. And Joseph, of course, is uh, remodeling the house and uh, putting on an extra bedroom and painting the white picket fence and uh, remodeling the kitchen and getting everything set up for the coming marriage. And Mary, of course, she's getting her hope chest together and the pots and pans and everything that goes with that and giggling in the garden. So that, that's where that is. And... Um, about a few months into the betrothal period, Mary disappears. Well, not exactly disappears, but, but goes down to Elizabeth, her cousin, which uh, she was gone for about three months, which, well, yeah, it's a little long, but hey, probably they're talking about the wedding and all that's going to go on, and so it's all good. Uh, and Joseph gets word of that, uh, wonders about it, but hey, it's all good. She comes back, and when she comes back, she's giving physical evidence to the fact that she is with child. A best man comes to Joseph and says, hey, you got a problem, son. Your wife-to-be has had an affair. And Joseph is brokenhearted. He's distressed. He's all upset, all the dreams, all the plans. You can imagine how he would feel. The rug has been pulled out from under him. Everything he's been preparing for now is just wiped out. This is awful. By Jewish law, he should go down and stone her to death. And he had a perfect right to do that. But he doesn't want to do that. In fact, he's not even sure the whole thing is true. So no doubt he investigates and finds out it definitely is true. His wife-to-be is with child. And being a just man... He doesn't want to stone her to death, and yet he can't marry her because if he married her, he would be embracing the evil that she's entered into, and he can't do that. And he's in an overwhelming bind. So the best thing to do in this case is just wipe your hands of the whole situation and run away. And so he does. 
he gives her a divorce because, remember, while they have not been living together, they are legally married through the contract. So he gives her, he's going to give her a divorce. So you've got a situation on your hands. Over on this hand, you've got this uh, virgin girl. Uh, she's righteous. She's pure. She's uh, blessed of God. She's uh, everything you would want in a wife to be. Over here, you've got Joseph. He's a just man. He is uh, right under, underneath the Jewish law, and he is, uh, he is a good man. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this, there is thrown this, this, this situation that just blows up the whole decency and future of the marriage. Now think about it. If you were an outsider looking at this situation, here's Mary, here's Joseph, and now, oop, what would you think? You would be probably, if you had any decency about you at all, you would be a little irate. And you would say, who has messed up this marriage? Who is the man that is allured, seduced Mary into an affair? Who is the individual who is so evil and so wicked that he got involved with another man's wife and seduced her into this relationship that literally is destroying both families. Where is the evil man that did this? And of course, you know, according to the passage, that there was no evil man. The one who did this was God. Now, you understand that there's no place in the Scriptures that you can even think in your mind that God had sexual relationships with a young lady. But this situation of Mary having Jesus in her womb is the result of an overwhelming God who is eternal in who he is, who has now invaded the space of this young couple and this woman's womb. And here he is. They are in this overwhelming dilemma because of God. I've thought a lot about that. What gives God the right to mess up the dreams of a young couple? What gives God the right to step into my life and to propose things that are going to put me in a Philippi jail, that are going to get me in the bind of pressures that I don't want, that are going to bring me discomfort in my living experience. See, I can understand a God coming and bringing to me all kinds of blessings and patting me on the head and feeding me lollipops and, and, and giving me plenty of money. See, I, I can buy into a God like that because that's, would be the kind of God I would want. But what kind of God has the right to step into my life and to take me in paths that are going to, oh, forevermore, the king's going to be after me, trying to kill me, and we're going to have to get on a mule and run for our lives in the middle of the night into exile into Alexandria, Egypt, and, and take our child with us and Shouldn't Christianity be, don't you want peace? Don't you want joy? Don't you want tickles up and down your spine? Don't you want to solve all your problems? Don't you want to be handsome? Don't you want, don't you want, don't you want? You can have, you can have, you can have. Shouldn't that be Christianity? Well, it isn't. <laughs> if you're looking for a way of escape, don't become a Christian. <laughs> if you're looking for a way out, don't become a Christian because this is the way in, son. This is in the midst of a battle. This is in the midst of divine will, which in the long run, I understand the concept that in the long run, whoo, you don't want to miss it, boy. But there are times. There are times. There are times. 
Uh, it's interesting that in the passage, and I don't know if I can explain this thing to you, but in the, in the passage, if you look at it with me in verse 18, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before, and in the original language of the Bible, there's a little word that comes right after the word before. It's only a little word, and it's not translated. It's not translated because it's untranslatable. It's not a word you would translate. It's only one letter. It's the, word, the letter A. It's a particle. And it's, always, it's put, when it's used in the Greek language, it's put there for emphasis, which says, I've painted this picture for you. I've given you this scenario. Here it all is. Now I'm going to tell you something that's going to disrupt, startle, upset, change, blossom, whatever the word is, this whole picture I've just painted you. So see what's exactly what he does. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. So here's the betrothal. Oh, isn't this nice? Oh, what a nice young couple. Oh, won't they? Well, hey, they'll have 10 kids. It'll be great. Wow, look at the house he's building. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. See, this is such a beautiful picture. Then he says, let me give you something that's just going to upset that whole thing. God has gotten himself involved in the middle of this. And again, I want to ask you, what on earth is it that gives God the right to step into the middle of this marriage and create this upset that they have? The answer is phenomenal. Because it's found in the Old Testament, it's found in the New Testament. In fact, the answer is a theme that runs from the beginning to the end of the entirety of the Scripture. The answer is found in the context of the way God talks. I want you to get this. It's found in the context of the way God talks about his relationship with us. fact I challenge you to do this get a strong exhaustive concordance and go to the word harlot look up every place in the in the old testament where the word harlot shows up and you know what you will find that about 95 percent of the time that the word harlot shows up it's God who is using the word and he's speaking of Israel Isn't that interesting? Why would God talk about Israel like a harlot? Let me read you a passage. Listen to this. God is speaking. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God, seeing you do all of these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. You erect your shrines at the, at the shrines at the head of every road. You build high places in every street. Yet you were not like normal harlots, because you scorned payment. You are an adulterous wife. You take strangers instead of your husband. Men make payments to all harlots, but you make your payment to your own lovers, and you hire them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You are opposite to other women in your harlotry because no one solicits you to be a harlot in that you gave payment and no payment was given to you. Therefore, you are the opposite. Now then, O harlot, hear the words of the Lord. Isn't that an interesting? God looks at Israel? (laughs) The whole prophecy and book of Hosea is set up on this. God comes to a prophet and says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to marry that prostitute over there. And Hosea says, whoa. And it wasn't just 
you know, go grab a prostitute and marry her. It was, he fell in love. They courted, evidently, and there was time involved, and he fell in love with her. He married her. They had several children. Everything was going well, and then she slipped back into prostitution. And in the book, Hosea is brokenhearted because he's lost his wife back to prostitution, and he goes looking for her. He hunts for month after month after month. Finally, as you know the story, finds her on an auction block being sold cheap as a slave. He buys her back. Didn't cost much. Brings her home sick, abused. Woos her back. Ministers to her. And when it was all over, get this, God came to Hosea and said, hey, now, Hosea, now, now, you can go and stand in front of my people Israel and you can tell them exactly how I feel. Because what your wife, Gomer, did to you is exactly what my people have done to me. Wow. Isn't it interesting? This really offends my masculinity. That God considers me his bride. And then my rebellion, my, you know, my independency, my, hey, my stepping out on my own, my doing my own thing, my, it's not just some light, superficial thing. It's that the core of the marriage, the intimacy, the oneness between God and myself What can I say, Jesus? I've been an unfaithful wife. I live for myself. I have snubbed you. And yet... You invade the marriage of a young couple, bring upset in their lives for the purpose of winning me back. I pray tonight in the name of Jesus that all the weight of my adultery and harlotry would fall upon me, would awaken and crush my spirit, and would bring me back to be yours. We cry out to you tonight, O oh God, for forgiveness, for redemption, for the moving of the Spirit of God within the hearts and lives of every one of us. For you have chosen us all to be your people. And we like sheep have all gone astray. Let the weight of your love tonight
woo us to yourself. What a fool we've been. Heads are bowed. Alders open. His love is speaking. He is a lover of your soul, your being. He is wooing you to himself. His desire is not damnation. He is not wagging the finger. He is a broken-hearted lover who desires your life. It's the message of Christmas. It's the message of the cross. It's the message that constantly pounds from the heart of God. It's the only message that ever comes from the lips of God. Hear his message to your heart tonight. Oh, how he wants you. You were created to be His. Moments of seeking. Be obedient.